Hi, thanks for coming to my talk, um, Tobias. Uh, I'll be talking about Prequel, a modern language for transforming data. And so without any further ado, this is Prequel, a simple, powerful pipeline SQL replacement. If you work with data and SQL or data frame APIs like Pandas or Polars or something like Dplyr in R or even like uh, LinQ in, in .NET, um, hopefully that this will look familiar to you. If it doesn't, then don't despair. Just uh, I'll hopefully by the end of the talk, I'll be able to change that. All right, so agenda, I've got four main um, areas that I'm going to cover. First, I we deserve a better language than SQL for transforming data. Then I'm going to use the national credit. They can use prequel. Finally, I'll talk a bit about the project and some examples if we have time for that. Can you all hear me? All right. Right, right, I work at Asset Management. We're in Cape uh, Town. Pension funds. Uh, currently, have about 30 billion rand under management. For the last five years, I've kind of been looking after our taken data from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, from um, Bloomberg, Reuters, and those things, and house them in a uh, data warehouse, and then generate insights you know, for our portfolio managers as well as our clients and the um, manager, um, C suite. So our stack is Docker, Airflow, DBT, and Python, and um, yeah, big believer in, in open source, uh, it's worked very well for us. And now just a little bit about myself, I've been working in the finance industry for about over 20 years, I uh, started as a, a quant, uh, for those of you that don't know what that is, that's kind of like a data scientist before data science kind of uh, was a term, and got an interest in keyboards and hiking with um, my kids and my pets, but um, yeah, they keep you pretty busy, so these days don't have as much time to contribute to open source as I used to, but I still find it very rewarding and I kind of encourage everyone to, to do the same. It doesn't take much to get started. My first ever contribution was like a small addition to Pandas, and it's just once you kind of you start, then you think actually this is great, I can help change things and make um, things better. All right, so let's start with the, the story of pre started on the 24th of January 2022 and with a post to Hacker News and that's the idea of the post and there's a QR code that you can scan and you know you can go there and that could be the end of my talk because from there you can read the, the, the manifesto that was proposed and follow the you know it was a proposal for a better SQL that will take you a link to a GitHub repo, and then you can follow all the action on GitHub and all the developments since then. But while that gives you a lot of data, that really doesn't give you much insight, does it? So I think what you're expecting from a 30-minute talk like this, you want to get some more information that's condensed and gives you insights that, at the end of the talk, empowers you to decide whether prequel is something you want to adopt into your workflow or not. And I think that's the same situation that we find ourselves at in our organizations and our companies. We're sitting on these big lakes of data and data stores, but we need to transform that into information and insights that really empower our decision makers to then like um, drive our, our business decisions. And um, yeah, the, so the proposal that was proposed, uh, um, you know, I think a lot of people that came and saw it, like myself included, it really resonated with them. I thought, no, this would be great. Like I really want something like this to exist. And since then, like, um, yeah, a lot of people got together and started building on it. And then if you look at the uh, GitHub star history, um, in red is our, the GitHub stars for prequel. And it's been on a, like a steep upward trajectory since that uh, 24th of January 2022. And even like overtaking some like notable other products like DBT Core in, in blue or um, Apache Iceberg in pink or like Dplyr in, in the our tidyverse in, in green. So, you know, we've seen that as like um, super encouraging and it's been like uh, great to see the, the reception that the project has and has really encouraged 
in us to like keep going and like build uh, more. All right, so first um, a little bit about SQL and SQL. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but like SQL is the lingua franca of, of data. You know, not only in relational database management systems like Postgres or SQL Server or Oracle, but increasingly you find it being like um, strapped onto everything. So like your data frame APIs will support um, SQL queries. Dply and R can support SQL queries. You have these um, modern data lake house engines like um, Apache Iceberg, Delta, and Hoodie that support SQL Spark, you know, will, will support uh, SQL. So it really is used everywhere that uh, data is used. And why is that? So we believe there's two key aspects of SQL. The first, that is, it is relational. And so the data is stored in tables with columns of a particular type and observations in, in rows. And that stands in opposition. There was a more tree-based model that was in competition in the 70s with SQL when it first um, came out. And um, also then, you know, two, 10 years ago, we had the wholeness of NoSQL movement. But a lot of these have come and gone, but the, um, the relational model is really the one that stood the test of time. And then the second aspect is that it's declarative. So you tell your query engine, what data do I want? And then the query engine can optimize your query for how to retrieve that data. And that, that is very important because it often knows a lot more about where your data is stored. It knows like what indices there are on the tables for efficient lookups, or depending on if the data is stored in, in memory or on SSD with fast random lookups versus like a hard drive or like a data um, lake house where it's stored in blob storage on the cloud, you know, that um, the query engine really has more information about how to optimize that query. Whereas if you made a, a sequence of like imperative statements, like in a traditional programming language, you know, like that might work in one use case, but it won't really translate well into other um, data source. So I think, you know, those two aspects are really what gives SQL that kind of universal nature, which is why it is support, supported so widely. So that's been really great, but now what are some of the problems with um, SQL? So SQL is built on relation algebra, and sometimes people think that the two are interchangeable, but I, you know, that is a mistake. I mean, first of all, SQL doesn't actually completely uh, properly implement relational algebra. And um, secondly, like, yeah, relation algebra is an independent thing. I think it's a very solid, like, mathematical um, theory, but SQL isn't the only thing. So I think, you know, we can keep relation algebra, but we don't have to stick with SQL. Then, of course, SQL was created in the 1970s. Um, it still looks like that, you know, like kind of like, like COBOL like with the, from the code from the 1970s. And then over the last 50 years, different database vendors have like wanted to incorporate new features, et cetera. Then all of that got patched into the SQL syntax, which made it very inconsistent. And for example, the select statement is like very overloaded. Um, so you have like in that first top one, you know, like you could a select could just return items from the table, or if you have some um, aggregation functions in there, then it actually does some like reduction and like uh, only returns like a few rows. So you don't really know what you're gonna um, get out. Um, whereas, yeah, so that, you know, that makes it difficult to read. And um, these things are maybe a little bit um, superficial, but I think you know, more foundationally, the big problem of SQL is that it's not composable. Now, some of you might say, no, that's not true. You've got correlated subqueries, and look, even that example I've shown that you can put a query in a from statement, and you can compose um, things, but not in the same way that we compose with other um, functional, um, other programming language. So where are the libraries of useful SQL queries that you download? You know, They don't exist. So I think that was really well captured in a tweet I saw recently, and you're saying, look, SQL queries are the single-use plastics of the, the code world. And as much as we don't want to pollute our oceans and our planet with, with plastic, like I, let's not pollute our code bases with um, SQL queries littered all over the show that and you have to copy and paste and adapt and like, you know, like it works in the one place and then how do you um, port your improvements from the one place to another place? So, you know, we, it's 2024, we can do better than that. Um, SQL is also not really um, consistent, and it's difficult to learn. So Julia Evans, who's a great um, educator um, and speaker, gave a talk at Strange Loop last year, and it, she's, you know, 
we encountered an interaction with a colleague who said that no, like, SQL is really difficult to learn. And she's like, no, what's hard about SQL? I mean, look, you've got a simple query here where like I've got my table of um, cats and you try and filter by the one, the owner that isn't number three. And then I group by the owner and I want to then filter by which owners have exactly two cats. And then I want to like decrease by the number of cats um, owned and or by, by the owner um, ID. And so that seems straightforward, but there's a lot hidden in here that if you're familiar with SQL, you don't see it anymore. But actually for a beginner, it's quite difficult. So the first thing is that these all have to be, these um, clauses have to be written in exactly that order. So like the select has to come first, then the from, then the where, then you group by, then you're having, then you order by. Like you know, if you put it in the wrong order, it won't compile, it won't run. And the, we're doing two filter operations, the one by owner and then another one by the number of cats owned. But in the one case, you have to use where, and in the other case, you have to use having, because you have to know that if you want to filter after a group by, then you have to use having. So there's all these little um, idiosyncrasies that like, you have to uh, know that it's very difficult for a beginner to, to pick up. And so her recommendation was saying that also, it doesn't follow the a logical flow of how you would think about it. Like most of us, when we start coding, we think, okay, well, what data do I have? Let me start with my table, and then like, you build it up from there. But, you know, with SQL, it's kind of the wrong way around. You have to like, start with the outputs, and then like, the from comes somewhere else. So it's, it's very difficult. Then um, another problem with SQL is the number of dialects uh, available. So 20 years ago, when I started, we were a SQL server shop, and maybe that didn't matter. Like I, I learned T-SQL, and I became um, good at it, and then I moved to a hedge fund in London, and there we used Oracle, and so I learned the Oracle syntax, but still I only used it there. But these days, as data scientists or data engineers, we actually have to ingest data from a whole lot of different sources. So maybe something sitting in a legacy Oracle database, some data is in a SQLite in a quick um, like local storage, then you also put Amazon Redshift or Snowflake, and each of these have their own SQL dialects, and now you have to juggle between them and try and remember um, which, how does it, uh, like what's the exact kind of syntax for the dialect you're working with. Um, which again, like just leads to a lot of like uh, cuts that like just um, trip foot guns that trip you up. So how do we fix it? Well, we, we believe relation algebra is fundamental and universal, so let's keep that. Then um, create a new language with consistent semantics and design syntax and compile to SQL. Because SQL is so like widely available, it's really great if you can compile the SQL that you can execute in a lot of different places. Plus, you can keep that declarative nature that I, I, I spoke about. So we still give the query optimizer the power to like really make your queries efficient. But um, yeah, so um, we have a much better uh, system to work with. And to make it easy for you, we compile to different um, dialects of SQL. So you can just learn prequel and you know target a particular database and Prequel will then generate the SQL dialect for the database that you need. Now, this is not the first attempt at creating SQL re uh, a replacement. And as Omar said in, in The Wire, you know, you come at the king, you best not miss. So we realize it's quite a, a, a big task. But uh, from the reception that we've gotten so far and the, I think the success we've had and the, the adoption we're seeing, I think you know, we're on the right track and it's going to really encourage to keep going. So I spoke a bit already about relational. So then the other, the first letter in prequel is P, is pipeline. And you know what we mean by that is that it really, it, um, prequel follows a logical flow. So you can read it like other code, you start at the top. So you say, I've got a table of invoices. So I say, let's take records from invoices. Then I can derive some additional new fields and new columns. So like a fee, for example, a constant column and an income column that is a total minus the fee. And there's already like some like improvements here that some of you might be aware. Like for example, in the income definition, I've reused the fee column, which is again something that you can't uh, do in SQL. Like you'd have to put it in a CTE and, and then put that further down. Whereas with prequel, you know, you, as soon as you've defined a field, you can uh, reuse it. There's a trailing comma, which also just, you know, like I'll talk a bit more about later, makes things simpler. But um, yeah, you can see, so like it's a logical flow, and each step of the pipeline um, feeds the logically feeds the data coming out of it to the next line below. So you just it's like really a data pipeline, and you just process data each 
as you go along. And it's also, yeah, we're aiming for like consistent. So you can see there like in line three, we have a filter. And then in line five, we also have a, a logical filter operation. But line five comes after a group by. But you know, we still, you can use the same filter command. You don't have to then switch to a having. And the compiler will under the hood kind of do the correct translation to give you the SQL that you uh, need. Um, there's some other niceties, which I'll cover more in detail later. But yeah, the main thing really is this, this logical flow from top to bottom. Then, and that's enabled because each of the um, keywords there is transformed. So you see the orange words on the left-hand side. I also find it like it's really just really nice and easy to scan your pipeline. You can see like, uh, look at the first word and see like what does each step here do? Like I'm doing a filter, a sort, et cetera. Um, yeah, and they, because they transform no clauses, you can actually cut that pipeline at any point and transport it somewhere else. And as long as the column definitions are all kind of valid, you know, like you can reorder things at will. And it also makes it easy to just comment out a line. So you can take out, comment out a line, take out that filter, and the whole query still works. Whereas if you've ever worked interactively with, with SQL and trying to like change things on the fly, there's a lot of shifting around. It just doesn't work easily like that. Um, another thing we're aiming for is that constructs are really orthogonal. So like follow that Unix philosophy of um, each transform does one thing and does it well and not overload uh, terms. And like another thing that's enabled by that is for example, that group by you know, takes as an argument another pipeline. Um, and you'll see an example of that later. So like you can just feed in any um, pipeline into like that thing. And that's because each of the parts like really works orthogonally to each other. And then the orthogonality also gives us a number of invariants. So like you know that select doesn't ever change the number of rows. Derive only adds columns to your data set. Filter only reduces the number of rows. Aggregate always produces a single row. Sometimes if the aggregate sits in a compound statement, like in a part of a group by, that will produce multiple rows. But the aggregate um, statement itself will always produce a, a single row. And so because of that, then we have a very small set of primitive transform. So only 12. And so it makes a language that's easy to learn and then easy to retain. So you don't always have to go back to the docs to figure out like what is the syntax um, for a particular transform. Now, some of you might, if you look through that list carefully, you realize, but hang on, there's some things missing here. Like what about distinct? For example, SQL has distinct. There's no like distinct keyword. Okay. So let's think about how, what does a distinct actually do? And if you have this query at the bottom, we want all distinct rows from a table that contains duplicates. Well, what you really mean by that is you want to group by each of the rows and then take one element from the group. So there's the prequel query that um, achieves that. And in fact, I generated the SQL query at the bottom by just running the top query through the prequel compiler. And then finally, um, and probably most importantly, actually, for composability, we really want uh, to be able to write functions. So at the top here, I um, define a function, take smallest, which takes um, two arguments, a number n and a table um, of yeah, TBL. And you know, we follow kind of like a functional sort of syntax like uh, derived from ML. And that function has three steps in its pipeline. It takes the records from that table, sorts them by the number of bytes in increasing order, and then takes the first n. So at the bottom, if I have a table of say like MP3 tracks, um, with you know the size of the track in in, in um, bytes, then I can just take from tracks and then apply that function. Um, take smallest three, which will give me the three smallest tracks in the whole table. Right. But with composability, then you can build things up. So what if I wanted the three smallest tracks per album? So with um, oh sorry. Yeah. I forgot here. So I mean, this translates to this SQL, which is not doesn't look like maybe that much simpler, so not, not much gained. But if I now want to get the three smallest tracks per album, in prequel, I just basically do a one-line change, and I say group by the album ID, and now I'll just run take smallest three um, on that, and that will you know produce the, the correct uh, query. Now, I challenge you to produce the same um, query in SQL, and I'm willing to to the first person that shows, um, shows me a valid SQL query that runs this, um, I will get this uh, solved for seeing the light. But uh, 
I have given this challenge a number of times, and I have yet to actually hand out that beer. But if you listen carefully, actually later on, you'll get a hint of how you can um, just solve that. So I really like the first person that shows me a, a valid query after the talk, the, the beer is yours. But uh, so please do give it a try. All right, so finally, like another thing is like we've learned a lot about programming languages in the last um, 50 years, and like a lot of things that just for developer productivity that make a language nice to like work with. You know, I think of them as ergonomics or micro features. So the one is that yeah, you can define your alias in front like a, a sort of variable declaration. Then we have f strings or string interpolation, so you can build up compound strings from um, field um, columns and just like you know make just much more intuitive way to like compose strings. So like here, for example, creating the full name by con Catching the first name and the last name with the space in between. Um, SQL data has missing data, um, so like you know, like you need to work with nulls. And yes, there's the coalesce um, uh, so function, but you know we've got a double question mark coalesce operator to just make it nice and ergonomic. To like, if you know you've got nulls somewhere, you can um, replace them with a default value. Um, I already mentioned you can uh, comment out lines, trailing commas. I've mentioned, and then we also have just digit separators in your numeric constants, which when you're, if you're working with amounts in the billions, like uh, like I do at work, you know, like an off by 10 error there, just gonna have quite big um, financial consequences when you're looking at three billion rather than 300 million uh, rands. So, you know, like just this, you know, just really helps guard against those kind of uh, things. All right, so hopefully I've convinced that, you know, prequels work have taking a look at, but we know use um, if you couldn't use it. And, but the good news is you, know, you can use prequel today. So the first thing is go and check out our online playground. So like scan that QR code or prequel-lang.org playground. We've got the compiler compiled to WASM. It runs in your browser. There's also DuckDB integrated and running in your browser with an example database. You can try interactive queries um, right now and just see the SQL that's generated. Um, you put your query on the left-hand side, generate SQL on the right-hand side, and then you can even work on some sample data and just see like how the, um, the transformations work. The number of databases already include prequel um, natively, so in particular DuckDB and ClickHouse. In, in DuckDB's case, with an extension you install, and ClickHouse actually is just part of the alternative query languages. It's already integrated. And in the last few months, we actually have a contribution of a Postgres extension, and um, yeah, which you also can install from GitHub. And it's not quite Postgres. I mean, you can write Postgres functions natively in prequel, um, but even for interactive use, you can create a string and put it in this, through this prequel function in a select statement, and um, that will also actually run um, natively. And I think you know the use cases here is that because prequel is really aimed at analytical use cases, like where you're doing interactive work with big complex analytical queries, like you're trying to refine a data set uh, and see like what get it um, yeah, get out there. So I think those are like, really like the, um, so DuckDB and ClickHouse, for example, are really like um, great, uh, very suitable for that. There's a VS Code extension, um, you know, given that's one of the most popular editors um, out there. And we have a number of language bindings in Python, R, JavaScript, Elixir, to name just a few. And we often get, like, as people learn about the project and get excited, they come and contribute an extension to the language that they're interested in. So that might be even more by now. And finally, we have a, a CLI, prequel C. And you know, with that, you can just pipe in some um, prequel query on standard in and produce SQL on standard out. So you can pipe in the query from stored in a file or something pipe out your um, query and then pipe that to your favorite um, uh, database CLI like uh, DuckDB or PSQL for Postgres or SQLite. All right, some examples. Um, I think I'll come back to, um, or yeah, the example, let's cover one quickly. So in the playground, the main example is actually very well documented and is a great place to get started and um, if you go to the playground, comment out the whole query, and then just uncomment it line by line from top to bottom, you will see the SQL transform at each step. And I think it's a great way to interactively learn um, prequel. Then there's a, um, a Jupyter notebook. 
if we have time, I can go back to this, but yeah, um, Preco also works in, in Jupyter, and we've got cell uh, magics. So you can, with the percentage percentage prequel um, at the top of your cell, then you can just write prequel code in your notebook. It will, it will work natively on data frames, pandas data frames, and actually produce also data frames as output. So you can just yeah, put, pull your data into a pandas data frame, manipulate it with prequel, and then you've got good another data frame coming out. And I've got actually some quite ex um, advanced examples on there. So for another talk I gave in a, in a finance context, like I uh, work out um, moving averages and in particular even exponentially moving uh, weighted moving averages on financial data, which a lot of people you know, think that like actually isn't possible in, in SQL, but it is actually doable. It's just very cumbersome. But with prequel, you can just define a function and then reuse it and like that makes it easy. So, right, I just wanted to um, spend a, a few minutes just talking about the project. So. Prequel is completely open source. Um, it's Apache 2 license, so you can use it commercially or you know, wherever you like. Um, it's completely volunteer driven, so no one's getting paid to, to work on, on Prequel. Um, there's no corporate association, and we will never monetize, and we, well, yeah, we're working on ways of how do we can really make that um, statement stick. So maybe like going through the Apache incubator, or becoming an Apache project or, or something, but that's really a core belief of all of the, the, the um, core team. Um, communities over 9,400 stars um, and counting, so I think it's 9,450. So if you'll go and start a repo after this today and see if you can get it over 9,500. So we've had a number of contributions, I think like probably over 60 by now, and four like people in the core team, and which are really um, geographically diverse. They all just um, we all just came together as part of just wanting to see this come to life uh, online. So it's not based on like a particular group in a company or somewhere, and if they abandon it, like it's become abandoned where I think it's just, uh, yeah, it's people scratching their own itch and like really using it for their day-to-day uh, -day work. So I think given that diversity, I think it's going to have um, a staying power. And then for our roadmap, obviously there are always more tests. Um, you can never have enough tests, so that's also, like if you try it out and you hit a, a bug, please report, uh, submit the bug report on um, GitHub as an issue. Like there's a really valuable, obviously they become then regression tests and just help us like improve uh, things going uh, forward. It's, then there's a, we're working on a module system. The, the first implementation of that is is working, but that's still gonna, I think, gonna change quite a bit. So um, yeah, that's still like in flux. We want to formalize the type system. And at the moment, um, Prequel kind of runs offline and it tries to do a lot of inf inference about like what columns are available in your tables, et cetera. And it will give you errors if you kind of do something that's inconsistent. But we haven't been reading the, um, the database schemas as yet. But it, again, there's like work on the way on a Lutra query runner using data fusion under the hood. And so we are going to starting to connect to the database and want to find a way to um, you know, pull the schema information down so we can give you even more kind of like auto-completion and validation of your queries um, at, at compile time. And we just was um, conscious about keeping it fast. So we really believe that, you know, prequel needs to be like interactively to have a quick uh, uh, evaluation ripple kind of um, feedback loop. And I think then also the nature of prequel that pipelined um, logic really like allows it to potentially target other backends, so, such as um, data frame APIs or like and Power Query or Power BI or like a substrate. Um, so that's also, I think, something I, I, I kind of like want to look at. And yeah, so anything that you want to see, that's open source, you know, um, please come chat to us. Um, you know, we very merge quickly, we're very open to contributions, a very friendly uh, community. And looking forward to seeing whatever, uh, yeah, you do with it and uh, any feedback. So come check out our website or the GitHub repo or Talk to us on um, Discord, and also then don't uh, forget to to rate the talk for time slot one. But uh, that's the end of my story. Open for questions. Thank you. Okay, first question down there. Um, so do we have a mic for them, or otherwise I'll repeat the question. Uh, can you uh, reverse? So the question is, can we reverse 
engineer the kind of prequel from SQL. So if you've got some existing um, SQL queries, you want to see what is the um, prequel for that. So not at the moment. That is a question we actually get fairly um, commonly. Uh, I have some ideas about that. And there's a project, a Python project called SQL Glot, um, which I don't know if you've heard of it, but they also like provide like um, they can translate between different um, SQL dialects. And we've been chatting to them, and I know they have um, someone working on implementing prequel. And once we, they have one, um, like one intermediate representation in, in inside that allows them to translate between the different dialects. Um, so, for example, like Ibis, the, um, the Python library, that also translates to um, the SQL glot uh, IR. And so, once I think prequel is incorporated in that, then you should be able to, because you could feed in that your SQL query into SQL glot, and then it might be able to produce a prequel for you. But it's, um, yeah, it's a very interesting point, and it's something we have been um, aware of and been thinking about how we could achieve it, but it's not as yet, but hopefully not too far in the future. So how the performance is uh, uh, comparatively uh, to this one? So is it like if it's a small set of data, then SQL is better? And no, 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 sorry, so. Um, thanks. So the question was that the, the chart I showed earlier on was the, the GitHub stars, whether that was a performance related. So no, that is the number of people that have starred the repo on GitHub over time. It's not performance. I can say a little bit about something about performance. Um, yeah, it hasn't been a, a target. So this is really aimed at developer productivity and like allowing you, you know, to work interactively. Um, and um, I think the from Hacker News discussions, people say, look, I think the queries it produces are normally are pretty good, um, but it's not, you know, the performance will still depend on your underlying database and like the optimizations that it does. Um, it's, you know, we're really just trying to make it simple for you to write your queries. And maybe just also related to that is like, is it production ready? So I think for the use case that we're aiming at, like interactive work, you know, where you inspect the data coming out, I think, you know, you definitely go and use it um, uh, for that, I mean, I, I do. It's, but yeah, it's not really, I think, for production, kind of wait until like the 1.0 release. But at the same time, we're not, we're not really aiming at those sort of cases where like CRUD queries or point, um, like point selection um, queries, which you're gonna run like a million times a day in your pr production like app. Um, it's really for like data scientists, like an, an interactive work and distilling um, data. So you can take a look at the output SQL and modify that or like you know, handcrafted if you if you want. Um, it's really just to keep you productive. And um, so for once-off queries, you know, like that maybe doesn't matter. But I think the SQL that it produces is is is, is pretty good actually, and it's closest to what you would write. It doesn't uh, put in like lots of cumbersome workarounds. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, that's great. So. And yes, he also said he said um, he's a producer to write queries for dashboards, and his feedback was that it provides uh, better queries, uh, writes better SQL than he does. So um, that's yeah, fantastic. That's great. I mean, I can tell you that beer example just to remind you, like I know that's one for example I didn't know how to to, to write, um, and or would have taken me a long time. And yeah, with that you can write it in, in three lines. So I think really just try it out, and you don't even have to install anything. Just run it in the in the playground and the browser and see what it produces. Sorry, I'm just curious, what is the compiler written? Compiler is written in Rust and um, yeah, and it has sort of two, four intermediate uh, sort of JSON YAML uh, representations. But uh, yeah. Just find the model you mentioned about the caching. Okay. Yeah, so no, at the moment there's no um, caching that we're like, looking at. How do we like, just pull the schema information down and um, yeah, how to represent it and then for the compiler to work with. And that sort of also goes sort of hand in hand with the, with the type system. We had a lot of discussions on the type system, um, but at the moment it's kind of just sort of like loosely typed, you know, it just produces SQL, um, but we, uh, that kind of works, but uh, we kind of wanted to tighten that up a bit and like give it a, a clearly defined uh, type system. But, uh... Database copy, is there a mechanic to query by the results? <laughs> Uh, no, so that's um, okay. That's an interesting question. So one thing I say that it only does select queries. So we you know we don't do any updates or deletes or like DDL. Um, um, so that's the uh, first point. Um, doing hints like no locks. 
there, there might be a workaround. So we do have a, um, in a sort of escape hatch, we call it, like S strings, similar to the, um, where you can just embed like pure SQL. If, so if there's something for which we don't provide a, um, uh, a function. And in fact, actually, a lot of the standard library is implemented that way, that like standard library functions are just functions which produce uh, S strings underneath. And um, they, so you can just embed SQL. So I know in, I've responded to some queries before, like people were asking about JSON. And like on Hacker News, I like the post with like, you just write, wrap like um, Postgres JSON functions with little prequel functions, and then you've got, you can manipulate your JSON with, with, with prequel. So I think that's an easy way to extend it. Um, there are some restrictions on the, um, on the S strings, like it does do some validation. Um, if you put the, uh, the, the field names in, in curly braces. Um, so I don't know if the no lock, you know, if that might work um, or not, but um, yeah, it's something interesting to look at. That's not something I've looked at before. Okay, now then, uh, thanks very much. And yeah, give it a try. And I hope to speak to you on Discord or, or GitHub. <laughs>